If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And uh, while you're turning there, uh, I can't quite imagine uh, what uh, will be when prayer is not necessary. Now, I don't know about you, but it takes me a little bit to pray. I think a lot of what we call prayer is not. Uh, when you get a hold of the master's garment, then you've prayed. But I can't quite imagine not having to pray to simply be in his presence. Right. But I do know that it's coming. First Corinthians 15, and we're going to begin reading in verse 34. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, and beginning uh, in verse 34. The Bible says, Awake to righteousness, and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But some man will say, How are the dead raised up? Raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that that thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain, if any chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth the body as it pleased him, as it ple as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another kind of flesh of beast, another of fishes, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. If it is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. Amen. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first that which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy, and the second man is of the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as it is heavenly, such are those also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the ones that are here this morning, Lord, that have uh, concern concerning their soul, and concern uh, regarding their spiritual condition. We pray that you bless this word to your honoring, and we're faithful to give you the praise for it, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, uh, I'll be preaching this morning, are you ready for Christ's coming? Now, the more we look about us, the more I believe at least that Christ's coming is near. Uh, and in many ways, and the Lord saved me over 40 years ago, uh, that's, still, that's still a bit scary to me. Can you imagine meeting the very holiness of Christ here? Because I fully believe, and 
uh, that he'll come down and say, it's enough, come up here, and we'll be called away. I think that's clearly what the Bible teaches. And then we'll have a, ready, a wedding celebration for seven years. And I believe that time is coming. Now, we live in a, we live in a corrupt day. But listen, you have not seen a corrupt day till God remove his spirit. Yeah. And you talk about sin reigning, that's a corrupt day. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to be left behind for that. Uh, those foolish movies from Hollywood, Hollywood left behind don't have a grain of truth in them. None of the elect will be left behind. What will be left behind is corruptness. What will be left behind is sin. And so that is, that is what is coming. Now, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, and he's starting to finish his last letter, or the last of this letter, excuse me, and he begins talking about end times. Now, I want you to see, and, and you know, this is one thing I guess I'll never know unless the Lord just opens it, opens it to me, but I don't know when one of the Lord's churches quit being a church. Do you? I really don't. I know that Rome, Rome was still a church. I believe it totally defected at one point. But I know when they got the letter, they were still a church. Corinth was a Greek church. Not one Jew in the whole assembly. And you know what? They had more trouble. That should make us Gentile believers be wary, right? And, and so we have that group. Uh, and then we have a number of churches, including the church at Laodicea, that apparently were still churches because they were still getting information. So I'm not real sure where that demarcation is. I've met preacher brethren that think they do. Uh, I'm not sure where they arrive at that. I wish they could show me from the Bible. But at any rate, I say that to say this. They were in trouble but the Lord was still concerned about them. Concerned enough to put them in mind of the end time. Verse 34 says, awake to righteousness. Now, what does it mean to be, to say awake? Well, you're waking somebody up, right? Uh, my youngest likes to sleep, and I have to go stick my head in the bedroom door and go wake up Bella. And you know why I have to say that? Because she's asleep. So we see one critical thing of this church, apparently. It was sleepy, or they were at least asleep to righteousness. Now, we as the Lord's people, we understand that grace is the regen only regenerate element to the soul. But he calls us to righteousness. That's why he said this, wake up, understand, and know for the redeemed, this is what is expected. Awake to righteousness and sin not. Very crude language, very high, high standards. And this is his call to the, the Greek church. For some have not the knowledge of God. Why do we want to do that? Why do we want to awake unto righteousness? To be a visual testimony. Just so people can look at you and say, hey, there's something different about them. It, it's, something, it, it's something I haven't seen before. Awake unto righteousness. How you answer things makes a great deal of difference. Uh, 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 there was a, a woman, and I'm not going to say who it is, over at the nursing home, and uh, she said something uh, uh, to Bella about me. I've never seen you in anything but a dress. And Bella said, well, I don't wear pants. And you know what? This woman belittled an 11-year-old child because of that. That's kind of sad, ain't it? Uh, that, that, that's kind of uh, a strange day. Bella, anticipate more of that because it is coming. But you know what? It, somewhere along the way, that woman noticed because if she hadn't, why would she have asked? Awake under righteousness. Awake. Look, look unto the things of God. Also, on the same thing, and I'm just telling you about to wake 
unto righteousness. One of my fellow employees said, Larry, I don't think you've ever, I've ever seen you mad talking about my response to this woman. And you know what? Shame on me for getting mad, but praise God, she not seen it up to that point. You see what I'm saying? We must awake unto righteousness. We must be an example to those that are around us. Verse 35, but some, say, some will say, how are the dead raised up? Now, they get into this thing of death, and you hear more and more about death and, and what's going on and what happens after death. And you, if you remember, it was these Greek type of believers that had that hillside of monuments and, and, and false gods. And there was one there, and Paul said, uh, and he said to the unknown God on the statue, and he says, here have you a, uh, a statue to the unknown God. And he knew that, so they were very, very concerned, and I use this term loosely, of the afterlife. How is the dead raised back up? Now, first of all, and I'll say this before I lose some, born once, die twice, born twice, die once. Now, what, what I mean by that, if you're born in the flesh, even everyone, when they're born in the flesh, they're facing two deaths. You're going to die someday in this flesh, and we're going to lay it out here in the lot next to the church, and that will be uh, the end of the flesh, but it is not the end of the spirit. And then you will be cast into hell, and later still, you'll be cast into the lake of fire. That's dying twice. But in the mercy and grace of God, if you're born once, and then the Lord bursts you into the family of God by His grace and goodness, the only death that you're concerned about is the one that this body will one day experience. Right. That's the only one you've got to worry about. And, and so as they began to talk about death, they did not have a very good understanding of the sustaining grace of God. A way to, uh, excuse me, uh, but some may say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Now, first of all, the question, how are they raised up, that is by the power of God. Now, anybody, just about any uh, uh, type of group, if you will, uh, will say that the second resurrection is dependent on God. Well, Listen, the first resurrection and salvation is just as dependent on God as raising up in the dead. What well, the Bible said? You were dead in your trespasses and in your sins, right? It's a spiritual death. It's just as dead as a dead body that uh, we see at the funeral home. And, and so in lieu of that, they began to ask these questions. Some, for some have not the knowledge of God, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, verse 36, thou fool, that thou which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And then he begins to tell them and uses an example of us planting stuff in our gardens. Now, if we plant out weed or beans, and I always like to think about beans because they come up almost immediately. In just a few days and you've got your beans coming back up, right? Uh, that one bean that we put in, do you anticipate getting out? Now, I don't. Because you know what's going to happen to that one bean? It's going to sprout and set up a root, a root system and if you pull it up, and at the end of the year, me and Don often pull our beans up just because we're sick of bending over and picking them. And if you pull them up, you can just pick, do them like this. And you know what? That first bean is not there. What, what, what's there? A root system. Totally unidentifiable from what we planted, right? But the thing that comes up and... That's one thing our little place grows is beans and beans and more beans upon beans. And uh, that, that, that's a good thing. And you know what? Uh, we do green beans most, uh, mostly, pretty much exclusively, and they're like this. Long green bean, you know, 
My mom, I mean, my nanny called them snap beans. They didn't snap them up. But what do you have to do to see what you planted? You had to break them open, right? <laughs> and they don't look much like what you started with, at least green beans don't. So whatever we come back as is not going to be the same. It's going to be joyous. Can you imagine? And I, I really can't. Uh, and it would be hard for any of us to never having a bad day. Now, every one of us, if we be honest, we have bad days. We have days like, I just don't think I can get up and do this again. Uh, but we have to, right? Can you imagine never approaching a day like that again? Planting something that's corrupt. Planting something, you know, uh, I, I think sometimes, well, I know sometimes because I've, I've seen it in, in my patient. Some people long for death. Oh, death, come on. Uh, I'm sick of this place. I'm done. You know what? <laughs> I'm not quite there, but I, 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 there's a few days I wish I could skip. Like Monday through Friday. <laughs> and... Uh, but it's not going to happen. And so Paul says, listen, when you are buried, what's coming out is going to be much greater. Verse 38, and again, God's sovereignty, but God giveth it, meaning whatever is planted, whatever is planted and comes back, giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. And, and I want you to see that God is in control just as he's in control of salvation and the sustaining of the soul, whatever the heavenly body will look like, it's up to him. Now, you know, a few times Paul and John tried to the best of their ability to kind of capture what some of what they were seeing. But I think it's just a glimpse, don't you? Bible says the half's not yet been told. So I'd like to see the other half, wouldn't you? And, and, and so we see that Paul relays a promise to these Corinthian believers that the heavenly body is much better. Verse 40, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Now, I am not an astrono astronomer. Uh, I have no idea what the differences of these two groups of stars are. But I've heard of the Milky Way, and that, that's a star system that you can look at. And then uh, there are other ones that you can see in different other places. And you know what? The arrangements of the stars are all different. They're not duplicate. There's one Milky Way and another body over this way, and they're all glorifying God, but in different ways. Uh, so I think the first thing we can look about at the glorified body, they're not going to be identical. Mine probably will differ from yours and, your, and yours from me. And you know you see in all these pictures uh, that all the angels are exactly alike. I don't even know that to be true. And, and so we find that when we put on the glorified body, it's going to be something praiseworthy. It's going to be something that gives God the glory. It's going to be something that certainly that we can't imagine, but yet and still we know distinctly it's not going to be like this. It's going to be innately different than what we have now. Then he begins to compare in verse 41, there is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, and one star differeth from another star in glory. And, and that, that is, and again, I want you to see, it's not talking about the here and now, although he does that, 
in another place in the Corinthian letter. In other words, uh, I've used this example before in our abilities. I can't sing. I can preach a little bit. Uh, my wife can't preach. Number one, uh, she's a woman, and uh, she don't have that ability anyway. But she can sing. You see what I'm saying? There's very individualistic talents that he gives his people. And when we get to the glorified body, it's going to be the same. It's going to be all giving praise to God, but yet it's still somewhat individualistic too. And Paul reminds them of this as uh, they're wondering about people that have already died and what will they be when they are resurrected. Verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. Now, I've sometimes wondered if Adam was saved or if he was there for the sustenance or the keeping of the line open, but apparently here he did have the new birth. Because it says he did. And we see Adam being the first example. But I do want you to also see, even though he was a created being, he didn't have a natural birth, what we think of. But the Lord God said he's still the same way. He was made out of dirt. You know, I didn't really know that that's what the Hebrew word for Adam was until my son told me. One day uh, we were talking about names and he goes, Dad, you named me Dirt. And I was like, well, that's not how I meant it. <laughs> so we see that even, even the first man had that nature and he needed a new birth and apparently somewhere along the way God granted it and he did because it says that his first one was for the spirit, and I mean for the uh, for the soul, and the second of the quickening of the inward man, the spirit. Howbeit that was not the howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward the spiritual. So he clarifies it in verse forty six. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Now, in verse 47, and as Brother Jared has already mentioned, we can't, we can't tell the redeemed from the lost, nor will we ever be able to do that. But we do know this, the lost are earthy. Or the word we use in the modern language is worldly. They are driven by this, what this world has to offer. That's the lost person. That's the person with one birth. That is the person that has never been born again, as you said to Lazarus. That is the individual that lacks regeneration. Verse 48. As it is earthy, such are also that that are earthy. As it is heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. So we find there is apparently an earthy distinction and a heavenly distinction. Now, years ago, I gave up on begging people to church, especially if they've been here and they've left. Uh, after I give them some hopefully wise counsel, I'm done. Because, you know, according to this verse, they were never here to start with. Pentecostal people say, man, that one ain't plugged in. I kind of know what they're talking about. You know what I'm saying? They're earthy. They prefer that stuff that's out there. That it's preferable for them to go to a tavern instead of coming to the house of God. And, and that seems like a severe case, but uh, it's preferable for them to stay home and watch TV instead of coming down to the house of God. You know what? There's nothing there that indicates they've had the second birth. Nothing. And so we find that Paul writes that 
redeemed people act like redeemed people. And lost people act like lost people. You ever, uh, hey, hey, uh, I know some of you talk Sunday school, Brother Jerry, Brother Junior, uh, uh, Brother Jody, Adam, and even just my years I taught school. You can tell when someone's listening, and you can tell when they're over there somewhere. Sure. You know what? That used to stress me out. It doesn't anymore. Because you know what? I can't plug you in. I can rant and rave and run and holler, but I can't plug you in. That takes the work of God, right? And, and so we find that Paul discusses these two types of people and makes it very clear who they are. Verse 49. As we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now he gets back to their primary question. What will we look like? What will these dead believers look like in glory? And he says, as you look earthy right now, one day you'll look heavenly. Now, we have a few glimpses of that. Remember, uh, I guess it's in 1 Samuel, maybe, I don't know. And I'll have to help me out. When the angel arrived and told Samson, mother, that Samson was going to be born. There was some kind of angelic being that related that message. Very same thing happened when Mary would uh, begat Jesus. And then he also went to Joseph and said, listen, don't put, don't put Mary away. This thing is ordained of God. Have you ever noticed none of those angels are really described in one place, and I, I can't remember, and it may have been when Samuel's daddy came down there, it said they saw this host of unbelievable things uh, uh, happening after he got this message. And so we see these great glorifying things. And then we see on the mount, Jesus revealing himself as God. And I don't know exactly what that was. I know it was a bright light. The Bible describes it as a bright light, much like what Paul uh, encountered on the road to Damascus. And said so they fell down and hid from it. That's the heavenly image. You know what? Two things about light. Light is purifying. This evening we're going to try to get a uh, uh, H uh, <laughs> uh, a light that will kill the load in our uh, cellar because mold can't live where there's light. So we see it's going to be a bright thing because it 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 uh, it lightens sin. It, it it destroys sin. And then we all know that you can see better with lights on. And so this thing is going to be gorgeous and glorifying and light filled. That's the people that are ready for Christ. Verse fifty. Now this I say, brethren that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Now, church, right now, the way we are, we are in no condition to go to heaven. Now, are we saved? Yes. Are we going to heaven? Yes, if you are saved. Are you going like you are? Absolutely not. Now, you'll either die and be planted out here in the lot next to the church, and we'll get to that in a minute, or you'll be changed. But either way, you're not going like you are. You know, life, age, has a degenerative process to your body. My friend, Stewart County uh, 
historical society on the the web page they have. I think he does this on purpose. I, I think I'm going to unprint the whole thing because he loves to get high school pictures of me and put them on the Stewart County historical page. Yeah. And he did one yesterday, and I looked at it and I was like, "Where is that kid at?" I didn't. I don't look the same. I don't think the same. I don't act the same. You see what I'm saying? Can you imagine a body that's not subject to aging? I mean, I can. But I know it's coming. Uh, and body, of course, I don't know what it's going to be. Like I said, we all may be gray-headed when we get there. But I was teaching that, and I said, man, you've got a lot of gray hair. And he's like, thanks, Dad. Um, a time when that won't come where loving care will no longer be necessary. I don't know what it is, but I do know that it's come. <clears throat> Places where your hips don't hurt and your shoulder don't pop out of socket. Things like that, 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 that we can't even imagine, but we know it is coming. However this celestial uh, new body will be, we do know that it is coming. And here he says, it has to come. Not only is it coming, it must come, or you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now, on the flip side are the lost people. When the rich man was thrown into hell, he made a number of statements, but this one sticks with me. For I am tormented in this flame. Remember a few things about him? His memory was intact. He remembered his brothers, right? Mm -hmm. He remembered Lazarus. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming those in hell, their memory is going to be intact. They're going to remember hearing the gospel. They're going to remember neglecting the gospel. That's right. They'll remember those things. The best I, the best I can see in other words, they're going to have the same body that we do now. Now, all the pains that you can have, if I can skip one, it would be a burn. Now, and I have to say, honestly, he got it from me because I used to love to fool with fire when I was a kid, but Matthew was worse than me. And uh, he came in, and at the time, I didn't know he'd been burned. And then he started hurting so bad, he had to tell me and Donna, and we tried to do some stuff with him. But at first he was like, no, I'm fine. And he didn't have any eyebrows. And I'm like, yeah, you're, you're great at it, Matthew. Burn hurts, don't it? Changes the way you look. Changes how you feel. Now, uh, it also can harden you. And so we find there are multiple reasons that this flesh has to be changed. Then he, says, then he says in verse 51, Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Then he moves to a second group, the ones that die in the faith. And then he, he moves to the individuals that are going to be living at the time of when Christ returns. Now, I want you to notice two things. We still have to be changed. I don't know what that experience of changing will be like. I don't even know that I'll, I'll get to see it. I may be out there and, and be one of those in the resurrection. I, I don't know how that will occur. But I do know this. It says that the Lord said himself, it, it must be changed. We're not all going to sleep. We're not going to all die. But this flesh has to be gotten rid of. <laughs> it cannot be in the presence of God. And, and, and so we find that as Paul is writing this, he addresses the dead in Christ, and then he addresses the time of the Lord's coming. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, 
The trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, you know what a moment and a twinkling is? That's it. Just boom. It's such a small amount of time, we can't measure it. That quick, and, it, and it's done. I think the Thessalonians, no, 2 Timothy says, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then us. And either way, it's just like that, and it's done. We shall be changed. We're, we're not going to look the same. We're not going to act the same. You know, I often think this, and I don't even know that's true. It's how the redeemed want to be. If you're really saved, it's how you would desire to look, how you would desire to present, how, how, how you would like to think. That's going to happen because the flesh will be like the inner man. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Now, the Bible says that Jesus was the first one to conquer death. Now, here we find that death is going to be gone. Now, that's hard to imagine to me, and maybe it's because of my chosen profession, but I can't imagine a time when death's not there. We were talking about a resident the other day, and she actually has improved a little bit, but having worked with this group of people literally all my life, I said, she's going down. I said, I don't look for her to recover. And my boss, who has a history as an obstetric nurse, goes, oh, don't say that. I said, why not? It's the truth. You know what? People are fearful of death, are they not? They really are. I think a lot of the redeemed are good, fearful of death. Now, I'm not fearful of death. Sometimes I'm fearful of how I might get there. I've always desired the death of my, my grandmother. She went out and got her wood for the evening, stacked it in a box beside the stove, sat down on the couch, and was gone. That, that's pretty good stuff, ain't it? On the other hand, her husband, my grandfather, languished for seven years. Which you think was the better? But again, not having a dog in that hunt, so to speak, Either way, if you're saved, you're going to give over to incorruption. You're going to give over to a new body. And if you're lost, you're going to keep what you have. Ever think about that? My father-in-law, I mean, excuse me, my grandfather, his stroke was on his left side. And he dragged his foot when he did walk. And this hand was like this. Now, supposedly, and he would, I mean, with, with his dementia from the stroke and stuff, he would often just sit there and say, thank the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, very repetitive. So maybe he was saved. I, I pray that he was. But if he wasn't, my papa is still suffering from a stroke that he had in 72. Ever think about that? If we don't put on incorruption, we keep what we have. That's a scary thought to me. I've had one kidney most of my life. If the Lord hadn't saved me, you know what? In eternity, I would have still had one kidney. People who die with dementia, in the next time, in the next time they still have dementia. Sobering thought, isn't it? So we get down to this. 
Are you saved? No. Mm -hmm. Have you put on incorruption? <clears throat> Do you even have the ability to put on incorruption? Do you really, really, really know Christ in an intimate, wonderful, close way? I didn't ask you if you know about Christ. Ask him if you knew him. There's a big difference in there, isn't it? I mean, we live in the Bible Belt, is what other people call it. Some of my friends up north kind of make fun of me. I said, well, you just need to come down there and you'll know the belt's broken. <laughs> I don't think uh, I don't think the South is what it used to be to you. I look around and see that, right? Those people know about Christ, but they don't know Christ. Right? What about you? What about you? What about you? Do you know Christ? 